just a couple of things I wanted to add about this, about naive bias, before going to the next uh, topic, which is <coughs> classification using vector spaces. Huh? Algebra, you know? Ah, we like algebra so much. Yeah. So, uh, one of the last thing I wanted to tell you is, first of all, which was the first application on naive bias classification? One of the first one, uh, of the first applications was spam assassin, which apparently seems to work pretty well for spam detection. I mean, email spam detection, you know? Using a number of features, I'm not going to go into the details, but just to, I wanted to make you aware that the methods, this very elementary method we just saw is actually not so naive. It is called naive bias, but it's not really naive. It can actually discriminate a lot of things. Um, so, essentially, why is it so effective? First of all, because it is not naive. Secondly, because from a, in a computational perspective, it is not that hard. You just need to estimate conditional probabilities. And you do this by counting the occurrences of terms in a document, right? So eventually, you, you have to go over the entire document collection. But if you don't do this, at least, what do you want to do, right? So. It is, let's say, asymptotically speaking, it is the least amount of work you may want to do. Um, also, it turns out in practice to be pretty robust to irrelevant features. So irrelevant features are those that will not add a lot of information to what you have. So if you didn't clean your, uh, your data uh, first, I mean, you don't, didn't clean it very well at least, Naive bias is still relatively robust to the pres presence of noise terms, for example. Okay. So naive bias uh, has scored pretty well in a number of competitions now dating back to the 90s, to the end of the 90s. In particular, KDD Cup 97 competition. So what is KDD? This is one of the most prominent conferences on data mining. KDD stands for Knowledge Discovery from Data. It's perhaps the top conference in data mining in general. Then there is more specialized ones. Okay. So, in a way, if you, if you have your own uh, text classification algorithm and you want to compare it with baselines, definitely naive bias should be one of those baselines. Okay. Um, Just a, couple of, just a couple of words about evaluation of classification tasks. So you have an algorithm, you want to decide how well it uh, performs on data. Hmm? First of all, what should you do? You have your data set, right? Normally, it's a supervised classification, so you have to train your, your, your algorithm on a training set and then apply it to a test set, okay? So, how should you do that? Well, first of all, you should keep training data and test data separate. Hmm? It seems pretty intuitive, but it is not always. Sometimes I've seen things that really I don't like, even in submitted papers, okay? Uh, how can you do that? Well, either you just have a training set on one side and the test set on the other side, but very often, in order to uh, increase your statistical significance, you would like to repeat the data, the, the experiment a number of times, and then take, for example, average results, hmm? average, the average of the results you got. How are you going to do that? Uh, there is a number of ways to do this. For example, you, you can have, you can take averages both with respect to different training sets and to different test sets. For example, you consider the same, train t the same training set, but then you take, I don't know, five different test sets, hmm? and then you compute your results, your performances, actually your results, your accuracy results, for those five different test sets, and then you average. Hmm? So you divide by five, you sum and divide by five. Or sometimes what people do is the following, you think of this as a 
as a data set, you, for example, split the data set into five chunks. Hmm? And then you do the following. You do what is called, uh, for example, five-fold cross-validation. I mean, five can be, become ten, okay? It is not a magic number. Uh, very often you find five, but it can be ten or twenty. Hmm? Very often the more the better. For example, in a circular way, you take the first four chunks as your training set and the last chunk is your test set. So in this case, you would consider first this one as the training set and this as the test set. Then you would shift by one. This will become your training set and this the test set and so on for five times. If you want to do things even, even more nicely, you can do a random uh, sampling of the training and the test set. And again, apply five-fold uh, cross-validation, okay? But this is two very important things to remember. First of all, keep training set and test set separate for obvious reasons, of course. The, the algorithm will be highly optimized for your training set. So if the test set contains parts of the training set, that's no good. Hmm? Yes, it's a bit cheating. Okay, that's a good reason to kill a paper. Second, you can perform, let's say, X-fold cross-validation. Okay? So, which are the measures you normally consider? Well, uh, a part, uh, partly it depends on how many classes you have. So, if, for example, you just want to, if you have two classes, actually a standard way a proceeding is, for example, considering accuracy, right? So the fraction of the test documents that you correctly classify. Let's say that, let's assume that you have 50% uh, accuracy. Will you jump and say, yeah, I got 50% or what? Eh? With two classes. 50% hmm? means random choice, okay? So let's say a random, classification scheme will do this more or less the same. So 50% is no good. Let's say you get 75%, it starts being more interesting, okay? So what can you do when you have more classes? You can check accuracy values for each class separately. And sometimes you can discover interesting things. For example, you can discover that on a given, so this was a real classification task considered from 1998, but anyway, you had to, uh, the classes were computer science departments and you had to classify different types of pages to the, assigning them to the, uh, the correct computer science department, okay? So in here you have different accuracy scores for different uh, classes. In some cases, these accuracy scores are relatively low, but you have to consider that the number of classes here is not two. It's considerably higher, okay? Um, what else did I want to say? Let me see. Yeah, uh, of course, there, depending on uh, the aspects, the angles that you want to consider on your experiments, you may consider different measures of how should I say, of effectiveness that we have seen, such as precision recall, F1, huh? that's the geometric average of precision and recall, okay? Those ones you can consider again, especially if you, for example, uh, also assign, uh, I don't know, uh, confidence scores to your classification. So for example, you don't just assign a label to documents in the test set, but you also assign a confidence score something that is sort of like a pr uh, probability and measures the confidence you have in the classification you made. In that case, you may uh, easily come up with rank lists of classification results, and then again, precision at K and so on makes sense, okay? Everything clear so far? This was just a quick uh, wrap up of 
naive bias. Now, let's come to this stuff. So, today I'm going to show you that in some sense, among other things, I'm going to show you that naive bias is an example of a linear classifier. Maybe, does, does this make sense to any of you, what I'm saying? Yes? So you already know this? The machine learning, I guess. To other of you, others of you, it doesn't make sense. Anyone? Who didn't take machine learning? Okay, so for a number of you, it may make little sense. Good. Because that's the very reason why I'm here today. So, um, when we consider naive bias, we were looking at documents very often as bug of words, right? Either as bug of words, for example, the multinomial model, uh, generative model, or as, um, let's say, uh, set vectors. I mean, we're just using binary vectors representing whether or not a term appears in the document. Let's go now to the multinomial case. So for you a document is a bag of words and uh, it can be represented as a vector in which each vector has a, each entry of the vector as a weight that reflects in some way the, uh, the frequency with which a given term appears in the document. Okay? You know a lot about this. The weights need not be the simple counts, they may be TF, IDF, whatever. But let's say that for now, for the rest of this lecture, a document for us, or actually another, uh, another type of object, will be a vector with the number of entries equal to the number of dimensions or features that we have, for example, the vocabulary size, and uh, a weight for every entry. Okay? Is that clear? Good. So, one thing that people pretty soon have started, uh, to, started to do is trying to leverage linear algebra. I mean, whenever you have points from a more or less high dimensional space, maybe, maybe, applying linear uh, not necessarily linear, but let's say applying algebraic techniques and considering this representation of documents as points in a high dimensional space can, uh, can, uh, um, can benefit you with the possibility of leveraging techniques for dealing with such objects. So many of these techniques are algebraic, okay? They are very sophisticated ones. Today we are going to begin with some let's say easy ones. Hmm? But even the easy ones I'm going to show actually uh, introduce a number of the real challenging problems that are specific to this area of computer science and that are still with us. I mean some of these problems are not yet fully understood. Okay? So how can I classify when I use vector spaces? Let me give you an example. So, one of the first problems with, with uh, vector spaces is that we are humans. We see two dimensions. Well, actually three dimensions, but when we are at the blackboard, we see two dimensions. Yeah, that's a big problem. Because most of the spaces to be of interest are of high dimensions. Unless you're doing computer graphics, let's say. But otherwise, they have high dimensions. Now, let's consider this simple, uh, this simple problem. We want to find some way to tell, uh, let's say, crosses from circles, okay? Can we tell them apart? Hmm? Yeah. Hmm. We fix this line. So a line is a hyperplane in a two-dimensional space, right? If you have ten dimensions, we call it a hyperplane. And it's, uh, in ten dimensions, it will be actually uh, a, a hypersurface with nine dimensions. Okay? That's the cor that is what corresponds to a line in a high-dimensional space. It becomes a hyperplane. 
But anyway, what is of interest to us is that if I give you this example, the human eye is going to tell the two clusters apart, right? Fantastic. Now, I give you this other example. And I still have uh, what is a ground truth, okay? So you always have to understand that whenever we are trying to classify something, there is a ground truth. So it means that we are assuming that there is some real truth there that we would like to uncover using some algorithm, okay? So in, in this example, the truth will be this point, some of which are circles and the others are crosses. I would like to find an algorithm to tell them apart using the geometry of the space. Now, the second example is not so friendly as the other one, right? For example, I don't think we are going to find a hyperplane, so a line that is separating the two clusters. Actually, the reason is that the, two, the points in the two clusters are mingled. I mean, they're mixed. Okay? Of course, I can come up with something that, more, that does a decent job, like this. I say in this case it's a decent job because this part contains mostly crosses, this part mostly circles. But if I wanted to find a line such that using that line as a separator I will make no mistakes, it is not possible. Not in this case, okay? So, our uh, first uh, issue with classification algorithm algorithms is that you cannot always be sure that you can come up with a classifier that will make zero mistakes. Actually, it is well known that for certain problems no classifier exists that will make zero mistakes. Okay? We'll come back to that. But this is a serious problem. So, this uh, also another point is that if we are just thinking in two dimensions Actually, I do not need an algorithm. I just need a human eye to tell one cluster from the others very often, right? I look at it. The trouble comes, troubles come when you are dealing with a high number of dimensions. Perhaps there is still clusters that you want to tell apart, but you don't see them. So you need a computer, you need some algorithm to help you with telling points of one cluster from the other. Okay, you see the point, the problem here? Good. So, in general, if the data set can be any, can be generating from any distribution, we cannot really hope of doing anything. So in a worst case scenario, we will not be able to distinguish anything. Okay, but very often what happens is that the worst case is not so realistic. I mean, if your data points really come up, are, ge are generated through, from two different distributions, hmm? for example, uh, let's say the circles represent documents about sports and crosses represent documents about politics, we can expect actually that if you represent them as points in a vector space, these points will be, will present some clustering. So, meaning that points, for example, corresponding to documents from politics tend to be closer together, in the average at least, than, uh, uh, than points of politics are close to points from sports, right? We can expect that. That's called the contiguity hypothesis, which we can, uh, in some sense, summarize in, in these two claims. The first one is probably uh, if the instance of the problem has a sense, documents in the same class form sort of a contiguous space, so they are clustered together. And also, documents from two different classes will be more or less well separated, okay? You see that? So, the ideal world is this. Hmm? These two hypotheses correspond to a picture like this. Reality is not a picture like this. Let's say it is a picture like this plus some noise. Okay? That is what makes the problem hard. What does it mean to learn a classifier? So I give you a training set, a set of points, and you want to learn a classifier. It essentially means in a high dimensional space 
to, to learn a surface, in our case it will be, for example, a line, that will separate the two uh, subset of points. Okay? I mean, it can be a line, sometimes it will be a surface, not a line. Okay? If it is a line or a hyperplane, we speak of a linear classifier, uh, otherwise it is not a non-linear classifier. Hmm? For example, whenever you use neural networks to classify objects, very often you are in the presence of non-linear classifiers. Okay? That's why you're using them. Today we will also see an example of a non-linear classifier, which is the k nearest neighbor algorithm. Now, I don't know if you realize, actually I don't, but there are three colors in this picture. Huh? Then you have a new, and uh, let's say that's your training set, and then you get a new point, and you want to understand which is the right color to assign to the new point, to your test, uh, to your test point. That's the standard classification problem. We already saw it uh, in the past lecture. So this is what naive bias tries to solve in the case of text documents, of text points, right? Um, So even if we didn't see, uh, we didn't look at the problem like here, even with naive bias classification, your problem is that of learning uh, a separation of these clusters using uh, uh, hyperplanes. We will see this later. We didn't see this at all for naive bias, but later I will show you why naive bias is actually a linear classifier. Uh, because it is not obvious it's a linear classifier. That is what you want to learn. Hmm? Um, before we come to the definition of centroid. So, can, you, can any one of you tell me what is a linear classifier? Because many of you seem to have heard of it. But in practice, what does it mean that it is a linear classifier? It's a function that... Hmm? It's a function that even... Uh, Who is speaking? Ah! It's a function that given an input, it's a model. So we are basically looking to learn a function that given an input, we can set out with the most probable uh, class of the... Great. How do you do that? So uh, why is it linear? Yeah, I have to look through all the training data for points and classes of points and look for the function that best approximates this correlation between... But it do, could be non-linear? Yeah. Okay, why... What, what is so special in linear classifiers? I mean, why are they... What does it mean that they are linear? I mean, what your colleague is saying is correct. Okay? I'm just trying to make it more precise. So, what does it mean that it's linear? It means that essentially your algorithm will look like this your classification algorithm. So once you have learned the classifier, what are you learning with the classifier? You're learning a set of weights. One weight per dimension, per feature of your high dimensional space. Okay? So whenever you have, uh, how should I say, score. So these are vectors. And this is a, a scalar, a number, okay? This is your weights. This is your input. Hmm? So this is your input. And what are you going to do? The standard linear classifier does the following. Uh, in, the, in the remainder, unless I, unless I say otherwise, in the remainder we are assuming that we have a binary classification task. So we want to decide whether a document belongs to a given class or not. Okay? Ah, oh, but how do I solve the problem when you have multiple classes? We'll come to that. But let's say the basic problem to address, the one in which you already have almost the full complexity of the problem, is the binary case. Okay, so we begin with that. So I have one class, let's call it C, and I want to decide whether or not 
huh? the new point I'm given belongs to the class or not. If I have a, uh, if I have a, a um, linear classifier, then essentially the goal, of, uh, the goal of the learning task is to learn a vector of a vector of weights of real weights. And in order to decide whether or not once I have learned the weights, how I learn the weight is immaterial for the moment. In some way. It may be naive bias, it can be something else. It can be support vector machines, it can be something else, okay? But in some way I learn the weights, and then what I do is the following. So the inner product. I compute the inner product. So this is the negated of class C, so rest of the world. Okay? That's simple. Uh, why greater or equal? You just change the sign, I mean it is, and then it becomes less or equal, okay? You always write it, uh, write it in this form, but greater or equal or less than equal is the same. That's a, that's a linear classifier. So the only thing that changes between a linear classifier and the other is the meaning of the point, perhaps, and how you compute the weights. That's your learning algorithm. Hmm? So the classifier is itself an algorithm, but the classifier algorithm is applied to the input points. The learning algorithm is how you learn the weights. Okay, so there are two, two points. You, first you learn the weights and then you apply the, the, uh, the classifier to classify the points. Whenever you, your algorithm looks like this, you are in the presence of a linear classifier. What does this mean? So, linear classifier experts, what is this describing? Or, what is this? Linear hmm? combination. Ah, of course, it's a linear combination, but what is? A hyperplane, yes, your colleague is right. So, if that's a hyperplane, that's the description of a hyperplane, which is simply saying that, is simply describing what is common among all the points that belong the hyper, to the hyperplane. All the points that belong to the hyperplane have as a common characteristic the fact that their inner product with the weights is a constant, okay? That is what defines a hyperplane. So whenever you, <coughs> you have a linear classifier, you're essentially defining a hyperplane like we were showing in this example. Hmm? Some hyperplane, actually, there are infinite of them. So this could be your hyperplane, for example. And then you're saying whatever is on one side, greater or equal, belongs to one class. Whatever is on the other side belongs to the other class. That is what a, a linear classifier is doing. It's just finding a hyperplane. Actually, your learning algorithm is finding a hyperplane. <clears throat> okay. Um, this will be useful to, to see now Rocchio classification algorithm, which is the first candidate that we are going to consider today. Um, any questions about this? Hmm? Yes or no? No? Good. Okay. So far, so good. So we know what a linear classifier is. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> we need another very important definition, which is the notion of, of a centroid. Actually, this stuff is far more important than you may suppose. So a centroid, I give you a set of points taken, for example, uh, from the subset of the training set that corresponds to the class you're interested in. Hmm? 
Okay, so I give you a set of vectors in a high dimensional space. You just take the average, I mean the, the vectorial average, of course. That is called a centroid. Why are centroids so important? Actually, there is, you can prove a number of things about proper, centroid properties in a high dimensional space. Okay, we are not going to discuss these today, but uh, they, they turn out to be extremely important. Have you ever heard of a centroid in relation to some algorithm? Tell me the algorithm. I'm trying to remember it. Yeah, it starts with K, for example. K means, right, uses centroids. And that's not by chance. Let's say uh, K, the K means algorithm, we should not be confused with the K-means problem. I mean, they, they use the same name for both for the algorithm, for Lloyd's algorithm and for the objective function of K-means. But this algorithm is locally optimal, only locally. Huh? And it's locally optimal because it, at some point it considers centroids. And we will come to that again. But let's say the notion of centroid is extremely important. So I give you a subset of the document collection and you give me the centroid. It is something that is easy to compute. It's a linear operation, okay? But centroids are extremely important. Now, uh, another thing we have to say before uh, we proceed is that very often we are interested in uh, unit points. So, unit points mean, means the following. that if you give me documents to process, I will not, con uh, so the vectors that correspond to the documents I want to process, I will not consider the original vectors, but rather scale down versions. Hmm? So the, uh, where this is the two norm. Whenever I don't write anything here, it is the two norm, this one, okay? So the Euclidean norm. Um, why do we want to do this? Because <coughs> I think I told you already in the past, if you consider, for example, Euclidean distances, they tend to be very sensitive to the absolute length of the vectors, right? Sometimes you, you, you say that two documents are far apart, even though the, the corresponding vectors are parallel, just because they have different lengths. So that's the reason why you scale up. If you scale them up, uh, then Euclidean distance becomes, essentially corresponds to taking cosine similarity. Actually, whenever the one is, is large, the other is small and vice versa. And, uh, and that's one reason. And we know that cosine similarity is robust. I mean, it really just measures the angle between two objects, two points, and not, does not take uh, absolute length into account, okay? So, in general, we assume that uh, documents or the vectors that correspond to documents have been normalized to have unit lengths. So actually, what you're doing, your points will be, belong to a beautiful one unit hypersphere. Huh? So the, the center is in the, the origin is in the middle and all the points are on the surface of your hypersphere, hmm? okay? Um, one last remark, even if your uh, vectors are, have unit lengths, when you sum them and take the average, maybe the centroid no longer has unit length. You see that? Huh? Taking the average of unit length vectors with respect to the two norm doesn't give you a unit length vector in general. Okay? Just to be aware of. Hmm? Any questions? Any more questions? No. Yes or no? Okay. So, well, why not should be asked at the end, not at the beginning, but anyway. Uh, have you, who knows what Rocchio classification is? Rocchio? Actually, it's called Rocchio, but the first paper which uses this one was not written by a guy named Rocchio, anyway. Probably no, probably it was the... the, the Let's say the method, the approach appears in some form, 
in something proposed by a guy named Rocky, but it's not, the first paper is not by Rocky. It's from 79, if I'm not wrong. Anyway, you know what Rocky classification is? Well, it is one of the most elementary ways in which you can classify documents using, using a training set. Hmm? So you know the labels of the documents in the training set. Uh, we'll come to this. So assume that the set of your classes is for now two classes, but the, uh, but the approach can be generalized to any number of classes, okay? So I just consider two classes for the moment for consistency with the rest, but this applies to K classes. Let's say your classes are... Hmm? These are the classes, and you have a training set of documents, okay? This is your training set. And let's say that this is the subset of training documents in class C. So you compute the centroid of this class. So you take all the vectors uh, you take all the vectors that belong to this class huh? so all the documents the vectors corresponding to all documents in this class you sum them you take the average and you have the centroid right likewise you will have a centroid for the other class okay hmm? so how is Rock Your Classifier going to work? Now, remember what you have to do. Remember what you have to do. So say that you have computed... So you compute the two centroids. Whenever you have a new point to classify, You do the obvious thing. You just map the point to the closest centroid, okay? You see it? People, are you okay with this? Huh? If I'm being too fast, you have to stop me. Because if I do not get any feedback from you, I will proceed. Or maybe I'm too slow, I don't know. Is this fine? Okay, so you're in, in some sense your model is just, the two, is just the two centroids which summarizes all the information you have about the training set. Whenever you get a new point to classify, you just map it to the closest centroid. Makes sense, right? I mean, it's intuitive. This is rock your classification. It's uh, very effective. I mean, very effective. It means that it gives you non-terrible results with a with little effort. It's, this is definitely not the best classifier. Hmm. But this, uh, let's say that this way of classifying is at least, how should I say, is a subroutine of k-means, for example, of the k-means clustering algorithm. Hmm. So mapping to the closest centroid, that's a subroutine of the k-means algorithm. So it, it deserves attention. At the same time, this is also a linear classifier. Do you see why it is a linear classifier or not? Who can tell me why Rocchio classifier is a linear classifier? You see my question? Huh? Look at the picture, use some creativity and you will get the answer. Eh. So what your colleague is saying is the following. Mm. Mm. Look at this. Let's connect these two points for the moment. 
this is a hyper, uh, this is a, a line. In this case, this is a line. Then I take the hyperplane, which is orthogonal to this line. Let's say, in this case, this is another line. This is my hyperplane, just in the middle. Whatever is on this side will go here. Whatever is on this side will go here, right? So it is a linear classifier. How do we prove this? I, I, I don't want to prove things. It is only because they help you understand uh, things in a more detail. Hmm? It's a linear classifier, right? So it means that this classifier here, the Rocchio classifier, must be defined in terms of what? Of a hyperplane, right? So W T X equal B. Uh, actually, how did he call it here? Uh, let me use the same notation. Let's call it theta. It is the same notation used in the book. Huh? I don't want to upset anyone. So let's call it theta, OK? So if I want to claim, argue this is a linear classifier, I have to, I have to say, I have to be able to say that this is something like this. So I have to be able to compute the weights and the constant parameter, right? In the end, whenever you do this, you are implicitly learning these parameters, these two parameters. What is W and what is theta? in this case. Look, they give you a strange formula. Hmm? Why is that formula right? The only reason why I'm going to show you how to derive this formula is that it helps you develop some ability with this type of things, okay? It's always good. I, I saw the slides, I saw this formula, and I said, hmm. We are not happy with the formula. We want to understand why and where you get it. OK, so how do you get it? No, the real reason why it is interesting is that it gives you an, uh, an example of how things become hard when you think in a high number of dimensions. OK, so let's try to understand why that formula is true. The picture you have is this one. This. Yeah. Actually, in, in three dimensions, this would be the picture. And how do you represent a hyperplane normally? Normally, you cannot really represent a hyperplane. I mean, a hyperplane is a surface. So actually, you describe a hyperplane just by saying which is the vector which is ortho orthogonal to the hyperplane. And it is this vector, right? Normally, you normalize it hmm? because there is infinite uh, vectors in that direction. So you just take one normalized version of it. Okay, so this is my hyperplane and it is described by this vector. So the vector joining the two centers and the hyperplane is right in the middle. Now, knowing this, I would like to compute this, this vector of coefficients and this value. How can I proceed? Well, the first thing I can do is imagine myself floating in the high dimensional space, having, uh, I don't know, 20,000 eyes or so, so that I can look at every direction independently. Mm, I can visualize things in multiple dimensions. And then the first thing I will try to do will be to rotate my body so that I actually see the picture like this. Okay, because that becomes easier to me. Mm? Is it clear, my first step? So when I float in space and rotate myself so that I see just uh, the hyperplane like this, hmm? and uh, I see it aligned with my axis, actually orthogonal to my axis, I align the axis of my body with this vector, what, is, what, what will I be seeing then? What I will be seeing will be this picture. Um, okay, it is C and uh, C negated, actually. Mm. 
Do you agree that, so after I rotated myself, now I see this. And I am aligned with, uh, now this has become the axis of my body. We are almost there. Now, the only problem is that where is the origin? You know this is a vectorial space, so I have to put an origin somewhere. Huh? I'm not always that lucky that the origin is here. Sometimes it is. Huh? But you know, you can shift the origin, you can do a lot of things. But we don't need to, to shift the origin. Where will the origin be? Somewhere. Maybe here. Okay? This is the origin. I don't put the axis because First of all, they might be disaligned, and secondly, there are so many. But, for sure, I can do one thing. This direction here. Hmm? You know, every direction, once is geometry. Another thing is how you represent vectors in a, in a vector space. All vectors start from the origin, right? So when I say this vector, actually, I mean the copy of this vector that is mapped onto the origin. So, I will have a vector which corresponds to this direction. Huh? And then, normally I will describe this direction taking this vector and divide it by its length. So, <coughs> this is the vector I'm interested in, by the way. Hmm? Okay? So, I map it to the origin and then I scale it to unit length. So, my vector, my direction vector is this one. Its length is one. Okay, everyone is happy with this so far? Now, which other information do I have? I have this information. This here, this point, the centroid. What is the centroid? It's another point. But a point in high dimensional space is a vector. Ever thought of that? Huh? It is not just a point. We call them points, but points are vectors. So, this is the one vector. Yeah? And then there is this other guy, which is this vector. Okay. Why am I doing all this mess? Because I want to write this equation in some sense. I want to understand what this equation corresponds to. So, how do I write this equation? Um, there is only one missing ingredient. Who are the points on the hyperplane? So, the separating surface is this one. Remember, I'm just observing, I'm just uh, observing a slice. This is a hyperplane going infinitely to, in any direction. So, let's, let's consider one point, one point X on this hyperplane. Huh? How can I describe X? X will be another vector, right? This is X. Hmm? What do all these vectors, so this goes to infinity as well, what do all the vectors here have in common? Do you see it? All the vectors that belong to this hyperplane, what do they have in common? Try to... They have the same distance between the two... If you take the projection, the projection of these vectors onto this, onto the direction, of the vector con uh, connecting the two centroids, the length will be the same. Do you see that? That is the only thing that all these vectors have in common. So, if I take x and I take another vector and I consider its projection on two this direction, I will obtain the same number, right? You see that? Great. So, what makes these vectors belong to the same surface is exactly this, this property. Let's try to write it down. Uh, how do I write it down? That's very simple. Let me see. Let's blank it. So, so let's, uh, let's, try to, let's try to write it down, what all these vectors have in common, okay? So I, I have to write down that the projection of these vectors, the projection of x onto this direction, is equal to this, is equal to this size, okay? 
one problem at a time. First of all, let's write down the projection of x onto this direction, shall we? Huh? Can you help me out? Can you help me out with it? What is the projection of x onto this direction? The inner product, right? But I have to be careful. When you want the projection, you don't just stay the inner product. You have to normalize. That is why I consider this vector. So let's uh, let's uh, let's write it uh, let's write it down. So I have to write x t times what? This vector. How do you write a vector? Oh, that's very easy. This vector is just uh, mi c1 minus mi c2, right? So I remember, mi c1 can be mi c, and mi c2 is mi c bar, OK? Just to be. But this is just an inner product. It is not a projection. I have to divide, I have to normalize the length of this vector, right? This is the two norm. Now, this is a projection. So what? Now I have to say that this should be equal to this length. You see this length? So how much is this length? Let's see. This length is the following. It is the point in the middle between this and this, right? You see this? So if you take this piece, hmm? and you take this piece, So let's call this D1 and uh, this D2, OK? How much is this length? D1 plus D2 divided 2, right? You agree? Good. How much is D1? D1 is just the, inner, is just, is just, uh, the projection of uh, me C1 on this direction, right? You see that? So, Wait always a few seconds before copying what I'm writing because I, I can change my mind. Anyway, let's write it like this. Uh, do you agree with this? I've just written the, so D1 is this. So it is just the inner product be between this and uh, one, the unit vector that represents the direction, right? This is D1 and this is D2. Okay, who is not convinced of this? Hmm? Yes or no? Yeah, it's a, uh, no. One first point, this is not really important. This appears on both sides, right? So, we can remove it.
Let me see if I am correct. Yes, I am correct, apparently. So, now let's, uh, let's just develop, let's just compute, uh, compute what comes out of this. So this is just uh, the squared norm of this vector, right? Hmm? Then this is the inner product between this vector and this other one. Then I have the inner product between the, the same, uh, sorry, here there is a, a T missing. Hmm? Then I have the inner product between this and this, but it's the same, right? Ah, inner products are symmetric. So, I can remove this. Okay, so this here, uh, sorry, this here goes away with this. Hmm? So that I am left okay hmm? is this a vector this is a vector or not yes we call it W hmm? is this a number so a scalar is it a number yeah We call it theta. Okay, that is your, that's it. So, <clears throat> I mean, this was not so much about finding the right values for those coefficients, for those parameters. It was just uh, about, I don't know, trying to instill into you the courage uh, of just uh, not being happy with the formula that you see. So, you see, I didn't do anything extraordinary, nothing. Okay, it was not something, oh, a deep theorem. There is no deep theorem here. It's just basic uh, geometry. Only sit down and make the damn basic geometry. Okay, don't be happy with what you see. It is one way to understand what we are talking about. Okay, and that's it. So, Rocchio is a linear classifier. We have discovered, after half an hour, we have discovered that Rocchio is a linear classifier. Wow. That's uh, what, after an hour, actually, we discovered that Rocchio is a linear classifier. What a result. No, I'm kidding. It's uh, actually, it's a good thing to have. Um, yeah. Another way of seeing this is that if you want to, in principle, if you wanted to apply a Rocchio classifier, you could just build a linear classifier with these coefficients and this parameter. Then you just take the inner product between your input, huh? and you check whether the inner product with this vector of weights is larger than theta or smaller. And then you classify accordingly. Hmm? So this is a fully equivalent to just instead computing the centroids and then mapping to the closest centroid, whichever you like more. Okay? The centroids you have to compute anyway. Hmm? I mean, the centroids have to be computed anyway. <clears throat> so another reason why Rocchio is uh, an interesting classifier, because as all, almost all uh, simple but principled things, it contains uh, some interesting ideas. So uh, very often you don't come up with the most beautiful algorithm ever. Very often you, you learn by trial and error. You start with some heuristic, uh, it will work sometimes, it will not work sometimes, but it's still it is intuitive. You try to understand why it doesn't work and you try to generalize it to make it more robust and powerful, okay? So in the case of Rocchio, it turns out that it is actually uh, a, a, simple, a simplified form of something much more sophisticated called uh, Fisher's linear discriminant. So Fisher is the guy, the guy from Fisher's text, you know? P-values, all that stuff. So this guy was a statistician with a very uh, great intuition. Uh, as a mathematician, 
I don't know how strong he was, but I, he had a, a great, great intuition. Uh, and in particular, he gives his name also to Fisher's linear discriminant. And actually, um, in some sense, it is a way of trying to characterize directions along which point sets can be separated. Okay? I'm not going to, this is beyond the scope of this course. But just be aware that this is actually a special case of something much more interesting and powerful as well. Uh, how does uh, Rocchio perform in classifying documents? Well, typically worse than naive bias. Okay? It's not, as I told you, naive bias is not naive at all. Now, uh, before I... Oh. When are we supposed to take our break? 20. Hmm? Just before uh, we go to... Can I cancel this away? Just before we go to K and N, which will be the second part of this lecture, uh, let's try to understand why... So, who can tell me why naive bias is a linear classifier? You said, uh, naive bias is a linear classifier? Yeah. Okay, why? I mean, it's a good thing to do because it allows us to recap, to go over naive bias again. Hmm? See if we missed something, perhaps. So, let's see why this is a naive... Let's try to remember what is the the kernel of naive bias classification. Essentially what you want to do is you want to, you estimate, these are estimates of your conditional probabilities and you know this is a way of writing that they are proportional to. Hmm? So in the multinomial case, it will be the number of tokens in your document. So the, the same token can be repeated more times. The same term can appear in, in different places of the documents. And then you, you have this. Sorry. Hmm? So given the class, what is the probability of finding that token in that position? And we know that whenever TK is the same, the probability is the same regardless of the position. I mean, be careful. Don't come to the exam and tell me, no, you know, when you're classifying documents, the probability that a token appears in one position is the same for all position. That's not true. It's true for our model. Eh? Yeah, be careful about that. Don't confuse models and reality. Models are just models. They capture important traits of reality sometimes, but they are only models. Okay? Now, let us consider the case of two classes like before, so we call C bar the other class, and we will have something similar. Is that correct? Yeah? Yeah, I mean, that's... Uh, so how are we going to decide that this document belongs to this class or this class. Implicitly, what we are doing is the following. We are just taking... Hmm? When we take the relationship, when we take the ratio, so the, the, cons, uh, the multiplicative term that appears here, you remember it was the probability of finding those terms in the document, goes away. So this is actually equal to... Do you agree? Hmm? You agree with this? Now, you remember, we are not doing this. So this is called uh, the odd ratio. 
odd ratio. Huh? So the odd ratio, when are we going to decide uh, that the document belongs to class C? When are we deciding, when does the document belong to class C in our opinion? How are we going to decide? Come on. It is the same strategy we saw last time, only I took the ratio this time. So if this is larger than one, then the class I mean, we say that the class is C. Otherwise, we say that the class is one, a is C bar, right? Good. But we didn't do this, because taking these values is a mess for numerical reasons. What did we take instead? The logarithms, right? Yeah, so let's, let's write the logarithms. Um, so if we take the log, we will have the log of this, of this ratio, of course I know that the log of a ratio is equal to the difference, just let me write it like this for simplicity, huh? otherwise I get equations like this. But what is, what is interesting is that here I get a sum. <laughs> We are almost done. So, this doesn't look like a linear classifier. My God. Does it? Let's see. So, well, this is... Um, this is actually uh, a number, right? This here. Okay. So, okay, let me go over, let me go one next, one more step. So, when we write, when we apply the multinomial model, right, the Bernoulli, the, not the Bernoulli model, the multinomial model, what are we saying? So, these are the tokens. So, this is the number of terms in the document, right? And every term can appear more than once in the document. We also know another thing in the multinomial model that whenever tk is the same, this probability is the same, right? By assumption. So we can write this sum not, no longer with respect to the positions, so the, to the number of tokens in the document, but with respect to the terms that appear in the document. You see my point? Huh? Is it clear? So just, uh, just let me be clear. I know I'm not a lot of fantasy. A rose is a rose. This is a document. In this case, nd equals 5, right? But the vocabulary here only has one, two, three terms, right? Okay? So, since the probability of finding rows here is the same as the probability of finding rows here, Whenever I find rows, I just put the probability of rows and count the number of times I find rows, right? So, let's call V the vocabulary. Hmm? Uh, of course, if the one term does not appear in, uh, in the document, we put a zero, we don't consider it, okay? So I put a D just to mean the, the terms that appear in the document. Hmm? 
Oh, actually, no, it's enough. So, now. Okay, for example, xi would be 2 for rows, 2 for a, and 1 for e's. Okay? You, do you agree that this is the same equation as this one? Actually, I have to honestly say I don't like this notation. I mean, it's a bit sloppy as a notation. Okay, I should, if I wanted to write it nicely, I should work a bit more on it. But uh, it's important that you just understand what I'm saying. Do you, is, is it okay? So here I just count the number of times the same term appears and I put a probability. Yes. What is the first part? Uh, the, the first log. The first log, log of PC divided by PC uh, bar? When uh, you rewrite the formula, you put PC e, even D and PC under. Wait, wait, wait. Ah, this one. Oh, because this is a mistake. Oh, that just, uh, there is no other reason other than a mistake. That's my, I, I, I copied. I, I, I'm not able to copy, let's put it this way, <laughs> okay? Now it's okay? Great. So, uh, we are almost there. Now, when do I want, when do I decide that the category is C? When this fraction is larger than one, right? If I take the log, what does it mean? At least zero, right? Good. At least zero. Huh? So the classifier is WI XI at least minus theta. Okay, that's a classifier. See you 15 minutes. Huh?